Hello and welcome back to the iRevise supplementary series for IGCSE or GCSE Physics. Last time we were looking at uh, some kinematics and graphing questions. We started some Newton's Laws questions. My goal in this video is to cover a little more Newton's Laws, momentum, a couple word problems, and we'll also cover uh, uh, moments, levers, that sort of thing that you might get. But uh, I think most GCSE programs do look at moments at least, so we'll try to get a few of those in as well. Number six, this is from uh, another uh, at Excel. This is a number six from January 2017, paper two. Uh, which of these is a scalar energy? There's no direction associated with energy. It's a scalar. Uh, moving on. Calculate the horizontal force acting on the van. Okay, you've got 8,000 in one direction. You've got uh, 1250 in the other so you will just you will just subtract and you will get 66750 does that seem about right yeah if I had a 12 on there yeah okay 6750 the mass of the van is uh, 2500 kilograms calculate the acceleration F net over mass. We've already kept this resultant force is the F net. So again, when it's a part I, double I, triple I, you, oh, state the equation linking. I, I, I skipped this. <laughs> state the equation. Well, the equation is F net equals MA. And that's what we've rearranged. If you missed that, I've written it here. I'm sure they'd give you the mark. But the point is, use all of these parts uh, I, double I, triple I. They'll all be. Uh, you know, put together, won't they? 4250 meters per second squared. It looks to me like you get a mark for the unit, so watch that. And try to make your numbers distinguishable from others. Let's take a look at the mark scheme, see how we did on that. Okay, so yeah, B, energy is a scalar. Uh, 6750, yep, yeah, good. Mass times acceleration. Allow standard symbols and rearrangements. Okay, so that's fine. And, and then we rearrange this to um, to get our answer. So what is, what is this now? Calculation, 2.7? What'd you do? <laughs> oh, in my rush. I hit subtract instead of divide. I didn't even check my answer there, did I? That was really, really bad. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. Absolutely brutal. Watch yourself. Don't make these mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, so so caught up with telling you about the unit. I didn't even look at that number there. And um, when you go to in your exam to check your work, this is what you do. You grab your calculator, you punch in the buttons, uh, you know the you know the numbers and the buttons a second time to double check these things. Is what you do. Okay, moving on. Uh, this looks like a five mark written answer. That's nice. Good. Okay. A graph shows how the velocity of the van changes with time. Explain the shape of the graph. Use ideas about forces in your answer. Okay. Um, I I think we can again take this graph. We'll break it up into three sections. We have a we have uh, again A B and C. A it's velocity increasing at a constant rate. The velocity is increasing at a constant rate. Uh, it's, it's a low velocity and it's not until we start the time to be going uh, you know up. The velocity is increased to a point and you know maybe maybe my line is a little maybe I could you know, maybe it's there. Okay, uh, velocity increases at a constant rate, uh, and you can say till about. I, I mean, at what point? I don't know. At what point do you see this start to curve? You can say uh, part B, and you can you can you can read a time off the graph if you like, but you could say I, I'm just going to say at some point. 
the velocity is high enough to cause significant drag. This drag lowers the resultant force or the net force. Okay? Now, because you've just done that calculation up here, haven't you? You've just you've just done this. You've done you've done that the net force, I mean I drew it vertically here, but net force is going to be this driving force minus the drag. Okay? The force of air resistance, the force of air friction, friction, all that sort of stuff. At some point the velocity is high enough to cause a uh, a significant drag. This drag lowers the net force. As the net force lowers, so does the acceleration. This is shown, or this is demonstrated, this is shown on the graph by the curved line. And if you want, you can add in something like IE, the velocity is increasing. You could say the velocity is increasing at a decreasing rate. And I've run out of room here. Okay. Decreasing rate. And you could just add at, at you know at that some point. You know, therefore part C the velocity is constant. Okay, uh, and then give, give you know give a value of you know, well, there's no there's no scale there, so it does doesn't matter. You could just say it, uh, it it it's constant. If you want, you can say it's a terminal velocity. I know you think of skydivers and things falling as having terminal velocity, but definitely you could even have uh, objects moving horizontally with a terminal velocity because it's it's the uh, the forces the drag force being balanced with um, the um, driving force. Okay. Right, so look, there's seven things that can be said here. Uh, seven things which can be said. Uh, wh what have we said? There is a resultant force to the right. Oof. Well, yes, we've said the velocity is increasing at a constant rate. Ideas about forces. How could I take that ex that that wording this, this here velocity increasing at a constant rate and talk about it in terms of forces well I know from Newton's first law that if there's an unbalanced force we will have an acceleration so if the velocity is increasing there's an acceleration if the acceleration is not equal to zero there is a uh, let's say there is a net force it's accelerating the vehicle. That's better. That's better than saying, oh, it's increasing at a constant rate. They want ideas about forces. Okay. Uh, so it accelerates. Okay. And we had said that the velocity was increasing uh, at a constant rate. So I I'll give us one mark for that. Okay. We could have had two if we'd said the net force is causing the acceleration. Okay. That's just, just a little bit detailed about what you see from the graph. Um, air resistance and friction increase as the speed increases, so the acceleration decreases. I believe we said that, didn't we? At some point, the velocity is high enough to cause drag. Uh, the drag lowers and the acceleration goes down. Good, we had said that. Eventually, the air resistance and fric uh, the air resistance and driving force are equal. Again, they want us to talk about forces, so we could said they are balanced. Hence, the the the, the force is zero, and the car is at a constant speed. So, what did we say? Uh, this is shown on the graph in the curved line. Okay. Well, you know what? I, I I'm going to do. I I think that this sentence here is more of a confidence 
sentence. This is what students do to write down and to justify what they've said. Um, it's off the graph. Yeah, that's fine. But I've wasted uh, two lines in writing this, and I, I ran out of room at the bottom. And this is a cut. So don't don't write superfluous things. If you want to double check that, that's fine. But you are running out of room as a result here. Anyways, the velocity is increasing at an in, a decreasing rate. Again, that's that's the same thing explaining this bit. I said the velocity was constant. So there's the third mark. We had said it accelerates. Right? We had one, two, three, uh, and then we said the velocity is constant here. So uh, maybe a very dodgy four out of five here. I don't know because uh, I said uh, car travels at a constant speed. We said the velocity is constant. Okay. Um, so we got four. But we could have explained why was the car traveling at a constant speed. It's because the forces were zero. <laughs> the net force was zero. Again, net force. The net force was zero. Okay, so this question here is specifically asking you to use ideas talking about forces. So uh, th this is a this is a Newton's first law uh, question all the way. There's the formula. Okay, yeah. So it's accelerating because there's a net force. It's no longer accelerating because there is no net force. Here, the net force is changing because the drag is increasing. Okay. Again, I, I think you read this mark scheme and you think, oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I know this. I know this. This all makes sense. But we didn't write it all down, did we? Okay. So we got four to five. Not bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, this the, the fact that these uh, forces equal each other eventually gives us to this. Now, had we gone the terminal velocity route, maybe we would have been compelled. We would have said, oh, well, we need to explain that the forces are equal. Okay, so for a question like this, and they're asking you to talk about forces, don't just talk about, oh, there's a drag, oh, there's gravity, oh, there's a, a motor force. Talk about, are the forces balanced, yes or no? And that should give you more of what you need, okay? And again, don't write the same thing uh, in three different sentences when you've already written it once. Save that room for something more important. Right. Good. Let's move on. This is uh, May or June 2008. I believe this is a, a paper uh, two. This is uh, at Excel, I believe, what we've got here. Um, a child runs out in front of a car. Driver makes an emergency stop. So we've got a little graphing question here. State the driver's reaction time. Okay, so the driver's reaction time is the time uh, needed uh, before the brake is pressed. It looks to me like we're not quite at, at one second. Uh, I think if you, you count, count 10 squares, I believe I believe us to say 0 0.08. State the time in seconds for the brakes to stop the car. Well, we're going to be at 0.8 all the way to, it looks to be like 4. So 4 minus 1 is 3, so minus 0.8. I'm going to say 3.2 seconds. Draw two more lines on the grid to show how the speed might change if the driver had been drinking alcohol and the road is slippery. Okay, well, uh, we know that uh, reaction time is affected by alcohol, so we'll have a longer uh, react. Oh, I can't get your line right on top. Draw one smooth line, remember. Let's uh, double the reaction time there, okay? And then it's going to be slippery road, so it's also not going to have the same gradient. So you want it to be more of a gradient, and you can tell. Now that, to me, you can kind of tell. The examiner would be able to tell that this, this distance down here is greater than this distance up here, and therefore we can see that the gradient is uh, a lot larger, okay? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, a lot shallower. All right, now just make sure you exaggerate this. Um, you know, no one's going to grab the ruler out and make measurements, so you do need to draw it in such a way that it's evident. Okay, so I, I'd say that that's that's well done. No need to look at the mark scheme. I'm pretty sure we've got that. Uh, uh, what else we got here? Condition of the tires and the condition of the road surface. Uh, are going to affect the force of friction on the car. Name one other factor that affects the force of friction on the car. Um, 
Well, I mean, we've already talked about the wet road, so I'm going to say weather. Yeah? Um, and another one that they like to say is uh, age of the car, but I guess that goes to condition of tires, doesn't it? Uh, you could say age of the road, really, if you wanted to talk about road surface. Uh, we'll leave it at weather. It's one mark. We'll see. There might be some other uh, options as well. And then here, center of gravity in the car is at the point X. Add to the diagram an arrow showing the weight of the car. Well, if that's where the center of mass is, that's where the weight acts from. And we've got weight, or you can write F sub G. Uh, it just says to, well, we should label it, right? So write out the whole word if you want. Weight. Okay. On the same paper, there's a number nine here. It also has another, um, it's a graphing type situation here. So let's, uh, let's have a look here. What property of the velocity time graph can be used to determine acceleration? Well, that's the gradient, or as we say in North America, the slope. Okay. It is not the area. The area, of course, is going to be uh, the distance in a velocity time graph. The gradient of a velocity time graph is the acceleration, and that's what they're asking for. Use the graph to calculate the boy's deceleration. Okay, so um, delta V over delta T, we know that we're going down, so it's a negative 6. Uh, the word deceleration takes that negative into account, so technically you don't really need it. I want to divide by, it looks to be like 0.25. So 6 divided by a quarter is the same as 6 times 4, and so we have got 24 meters per second. So that's a pretty fast deceleration. Uh, calculate re the resultant force on the boy. We remember that F net is equal to MA, and so it's mass times that acceleration we've just calculated. And so we're going to get quite a large force here of 1680. Okay, and then finally, uh, explain why the boy should bend his knees as he lands. It's like this, okay? Bending knees means a longer time to decelerate. If If you have a longer time to decelerate, you have a lower acceleration. Okay, bending knee, bendings, bending the bending knees means a longer time to decelerate and a lower acceleration, which in turn results in a lower, I won't say net force, I'll just say in a lower force uh, exerted on the boys. You could say uh, muscles, body, maybe <laughs> compressing his spine, whatever. He's not going to break his uh, ankle. All right, we'll really quickly go back to the mark scheme for the number one and nine there. So we can see here, uh, yeah, we are right on all those math answers. That's fine. Um, they want you to draw one line horizontal beyond point eight. Yeah, that's what we had. And then a less steep uh, line down. Okay. Um, correct answer here. Remember, the question was name one other factor that affects the force of friction on the car. So they've got air resistance, okay, yeah, mass of the car, speed, ooh, speed of the car. Oh, these are all very straightforward here. Um, brakes, tire pressure, nice area of tire, mm-hmm, cool, streamlining. Right, th those are all nice, acceptable answers, weight, drag, gravity, so, okay. And then wind or temperature, it says reject, so I got to... Uh, I got kicked to the curb on that one there. One other factor which affects the force of friction, I think which was what threw me off on here was I was, I just, well, we've already talked about this, we've already talked about that, but yeah, there's plenty of things which could be discussed there. Um, not quite as simple as I thought. So uh, you need to think a little more in terms of the physics. Now, I, you know, I suppose uh, if, here's 
whenever I've made a mistake and I, I and I looked down, oh look at there's a part two related to a part one. My part two here was to 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 draw the weight in there. Yeah? Yeah? This weight is related to the center of gravity. That is related to forces acting on it, so um it's going to affect the force of friction. You don't even need to know the formula for that. So sometimes um, you can use uh, questions that you do later on to help you with the previous one. So there's plenty of stuff to talk about here. Yeah, wind resistance, brakes, tire pressure is a very good one. And if you're into racing, you understand, you know, they do the little burnouts to get the tires hot ahead of time, melt the rubber a little bit, get it to grip more. Okay, so there we go. And then we draw a, a line going straight down from that center of mass, so that's fine too. We'll skip on down to the mark scheme for number nine as well. Yes, we had gradient uh, 24 meters per second squared. Okay, we had the formula right for the mass. And then the other, the other question, why should the boy bend his knees as he lands? Uh, any three points, they say here. So it's the same change in velocity. Look at the see the graph here. It's going to be a change from from uh, six meters per second to zero, no matter what. So you might as well drag that out for as long as you can. That's that's what we do with the parachute, isn't it? Now a kid doesn't have a parachute, but uh, most people that when they do parachute, they will bend their knees and they actually try to roll when they hit the ground. If you've ever gone skydiving, that's what you do. So um, yeah, so it's the same change in velocity. Okay, uh, we're going to do it in more time, means less acceleration, and that means less force. These are the things that we had said. Less force, okay, L lower impact, okay. Okay, moving on, really, we've got a real quick one here. Um, fill in the blanks, again, this this is a uh, another GCSC. This is a uh, November uh, 2009. So... Work done is equal to blank times blank. Okay, well that's that's going to be equal to that's going to be equal to force times distance moved in the direction of the force. Calculate the useful output, and so what's the formula there? Uh, we we did a, a work question in the other video. It was power was equal to work divided by time. So what's the power output? Looks to me like it's going to be 2,000 joules divided by 5 seconds, so so 400 watts. Factory is 100 efficient because it's, it's working all the time. Um, she has to see a flow diagram because she doesn't quite believe this. There is some waste energy. Write down a formula for efficiency. Right, so percentage efficiency quite simply is a lot of people like to say output over input but uh, there's two types of outputs here so we'll say it's useful output over input it's the useful uh, over the input and so this this ends up being uh, basically uh, oop, not three over five it'll be two over five it's it's twenty thousand over fifty thousand so it's two over five it's point four okay uh, that's efficiency I suppose uh, percentage efficiency you would multiply by a hundred so you know if you want uh, yeah if you wanted to you would say it's it's forty percent okay calculate Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've gone and done it. There's the formula, and then calculate the efficiency, and, and, and we've done it here, so it's it's 40%. So really, really, the, te the, the formula really should be, uh, it's that ratio times 100%. Right, we'll go on and take a look at the answers. Yes, force, distance, direction, yes, correct, 400 watts. Efficiency, there's the formula. It's useful output over input and it doesn't need to be energy it could be work as well all right now wh what is this input minus waste energy yeah well that might be true you might not always be given the output you might only be told what the waste is so that could be useful and there we go 40 percent okay let's move on this is a uh june 2011 this is a paper two uh again this is another um at excel i believe it's igcse and this is a good question. It's about uh, momentum and crash test dummies and this sort of thing. So in one test, the dummy uh, and the car travel at 8 meters per second. The mass of the dummy is 72. Calculate the momentum. Okay, so momentum is that formula. They may or may not be giving it to you. I don't know. So 78 uh, times 8 is going to be actually the same thing as 9 times 64. Uh, but Either way, you're going to have to probably grab your calculator. It's going to be 576 kilogram meters per second. 
And in another test, the dummy changes by 920 in a time of 0.17 seconds. Now, this formula comes from your uh, Fnet. What is it is equal to the rate of change of momentum, and the little the little delta t is going to move up there. Our change in momentum is going. They're asking what is the average horizontal force. Our change in momentum is equal to this net force, which is going to be our average force. This is the impulse, the change in momentum. So we've got 920. We're going to have to divide that by 0.17. If you're not sure about this, you can check out uh, check out this video by 10 Minute Physics. I kind of go through the derivation of all this. We'll take uh, the 920, we'll divide by 0.17, and an average force of, uh, I'm going to just round it to 5,412 newtons. It'll be a large force. It's quite a large change in momentum in a very small amount of time. Okay. Uh, these tests help make the road safer. State two factors that affect the stopping distance. Okay. So, I mean, we just seen this a moment ago, but we could say condition of... Uh, tires, uh, road, that sort of thing. You might say um, that's condition of road. You might say weather conditions. I know, I know, I got burnt on that last one. All right, weather conditions, wet versus dry, that sort of thing. Um, anything else? Yeah, because that last question that we saw was more about uh, what would it had to do with forces. And this is about the stopping distance. So um, I, I'm happy with those two answers for now. We'll take a look at the mark scheme and see how detailed they get. Um, use the ideas of momentum to explain how the crumple zones of the car help to reduce injuries during a crash. Well, it, it actually all comes back to, to this impulse change in momentum equation, doesn't it? Okay, there's an inverse proportionality. You know that if you can increase the time needed for something to uh, change its momentum, which will be constant, it means a, a, a lower force will be required. So it's kind of like, look, you're in the car. The car is going to come to a stop no matter what, and so are you. Um, but if we can kind of delay, um, you know, the, the, the stopping that you would experience, because you're not going to stop as quickly as a car, then that means you will experience less force, less whiplash, less injuries, and that sort of thing. This is what seatbelts, airbags, and all that kind of thing do. Okay, and the crumple zone, same type thing. So we could say, you know, by increasing uh, contact time, because of constant and I'm, uh, because of constant change in momentum the force will decrease or you could say something along the lines of uh, contact time and and force are are inversely proportional, okay? And then that means uh, that means uh, less force exerted on a uh, person, passenger, driver to stop them. That's basically it. I, I'm kind of rushing through for time. Um, we can be a little more eloquent and certainly a lot neater. But uh, let's take a look at what they've got on the mark scheme here. This is for number seven. Right, so 580. Ooh, what did I say? Okay, so they've rounded up to, uh, to two sig figs. Okay, talk to your teacher, talk to your examiner, uh, exam board, you look at the things to see how they would do that. Uh, 5400, I had, I had 5412, yeah, we had 5412, so that's accepted, that's okay. Um, and then and then, what about the conditions? What, what was the question here again? Scroll, baby. Okay, and then, so what was the question here? Two factors to, uh, that would affect the stopping distance, right? So we had said uh, road, we had said wet or dry. 
Okay, could be icy, whatever. Uh, could be surface related. This is good, yeah, whether it's gravel mo road or mud road or freshly tarmacked, that kind of thing, oily, that type thing. I remember one time I was trying to turn real quick and I uh, spun out in this gravel in uh, the family station wagon and I nearly hit my brother who was walking on the road there. Uh, you, you can't spin out quickly on the gravel. you got to be careful. Uh, gradient, yeah, if you're going uphill or downhill, that's something we might not think about. So that's good. Okay. Um, so so that that was, um, I've done the weather-related, and I talked about, I said condition of road and tires. It's a bit vague, it seems. Um, car, quality of tires, quality of brakes. I guess that, I got the second mark there. That's fine. Uh, Momentum-related, your speed and how many passengers, how, how much momentum do you have? So so the heavier, if you've got a big truck, a big lorry, a big transport truck compared to like a little smart car, okay, so the more momentum. So that it could, it could not just be the speed, how fast you're going, how massive you're going, okay? Um, and then finally, Oh, yeah, stopping distance based on what we were talking about before. I just thought about the the actual, I was thinking braking distance, but you do also have the reaction time, the thinking distance. And so driver, this is thinking distance. Um, are they tired? Are they on drugs? Have they been drinking? Are they distracted? Are they on their phone? Are they fiddling for a radio station? Remember why one time we ranted somebody because I was fiddling with the radio station? Uh, arguing with my girlfriend about the radio and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so always be alert and don't get yourself distracted, especially mobile phones. That's a real uh, problem these days. Right, this is just a simple little four mark question. No need to look at any mark scheme. We'll just uh, quickly go through it here. Uh, how do you know that the train is decelerating in part C? Well, we could say that the gradient is negative so that's probably good uh, state the features of the graph that represent the distance traveled uh, it's the area it's it's going to be the area under the curve and if you want you can say a plus b plus c each of these three regions needs to be added. A second train travels between stations at a constant velocity and does not stop. It takes the same time as the first train on the axis above draw line showing the motion of the second train. It travels between the two stations uh, at a constant velocity. It takes the same time. Well, I, w I would little dotted line up there and I would say um, it says a constant velocity. It doesn't matter where. I'm going to just say that's the constant velocity all the way through. Okay. You could draw your, it just needs to be a straight horizontal line. I would use a ruler. Okay. I'm a little wobbly because I'm using this pen, but I would uh, straight line. You know, you could have it go through there. You could have it up above. You could have it below. As long as it's a straight line. I, I would imagine that uh, this first one I drew is ample. Let's move on. Okay, this is a lovely question. We're getting into some momentum stuff here now. Um, let's see. We've got somebody who is throwing a snowball while they are skating. Link the equation linking momentum, mass, and velocity. Very straightforward. This, by the way, is a June 2015 paper 2 um, IGCSE. Calculate the initial momentum of the snowball. Okay, so we've got the equation there. Um, it's got a mass of 0.23 and it's being thrown with a velocity of 13. So that's going to give uh, 2.99. Uh, shall we round that up to 3.0 kilogram meter per second? Let's see. And then uh, Part B, when the skater throws the snowball forward, she slides backwards on the ice. Why does she move in this direction? This is similar to uh, uh, what you might have with the recoil of a, of a rifle. Okay, There's no friction here. So in order to exert a force to give this uh, snowball the ability to move forward, there must be an equal and opposite force which is going to work backwards. And these mo this, is, this leads to the conservation of momentum. Okay, So... Again, you can take a look uh, at, at the details of this, um, but I know, I know, uh, you know, look on Khan Academy, 10 Minute Physics, uh, good channels, um, you, you got Physics Classroom, you can look at the details of this, but, but basically, what are we trying to say here? Um, we, we, we're gonna, we know we've got conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum. What is one of the uh, criteria there? is no external forces 
acting. Why do we know that? Well, because they're on the ice and there's no friction. There's no external forces acting. Therefore, conservation of momentum holds and the thrower experiences a force backwards okay the ex the thrower experiences a a force or if you like change in momentum a change in momentum backwards because remember that uh force is the rate of change of momentum so something along those lines, we'll look at that answer in a moment. Uh, a skater wears soft knee pads that compress easily. Explain how these pads protect your knees when she falls on the ice. This is just like the other question that we had before. We had F net times this uh, delta T, and it's, it's this change in momentum. Okay, When you fall, you will experience a change in momentum. You will come to rest. If you can increase the, the time for this uh, to happen, then you will decrease the force being experienced. It's very kind of straightforward. Um, you know, again, I'm going to write this shorthand just in the interest of time, but we can say um, when uh, the change in momentum is constant, if change in time uh, I was going to write an arrow and be lazy, but I'll write out the word and say if, if the change in time increases, then force decreases. And if you'd like, you can say force exerted on person okay, is going to decrease. Something along those lines. And then you can say, therefore, it will, uh, it will hurt less that sort of stuff okay you you won't break your uh you know you won't hurt yourself okay break your knee or whatever okay let's look at the mark scheme on that one. Oh, did i say 2018 or 2015 it's 2015 right so they've rounded it up to three kilogram meter per second that's fine you get a mark for the formula up above substitution and evaluation something like that you get uh, one mark and then your answer second mark okay um Part B, there's two, yeah, I remember doing this with some students, and it's a bit tricky. There's two ways you can answer this, part B. You can either do it in terms of forces or in terms of momentum. Some students mix the two together, and it becomes a, a debacle, okay? Follow one line of thinking and leave it at that. If you're going to mention law of conservation of momentum, which I feel that we did, Okay, we'd said there's no external forces acting, therefore we've got conservation of momentum, so I'd say one mark, okay? And uh, if that's the case, uh, the momentum of the snowball and the skater um, needs to be equal and opposite because their momentum is initially zero. You could say something to the effect of uh, the momentum of these two are the same but in equal and opposite directions. You could have left it at that. You wouldn't have needed the initial momentum zero. But if you were to look at the equation, uh, the, the the momentum of the you know the girl throwing the ball should be equal, op equal and opposite to the momentum of the b uh, ball uh, due to the girl or the ball's force on the girl pushing her back. They need to be equal and opposite. And that means when you rearrange this equation and you add them, it means the total is zero. Okay. Um, okay. What else could we have said? Mention of action and reaction. Oh, let be very careful about this. Watch the 10 minute physics video. Uh, they, they go through and clarify this. Uh, but Newton's third, you could say Newton's third law, uh, the forces on the skater and the snowball are equal and opposite. And, you know, the rate of change of momentum is the same on both of them. Okay, uh, how did I do on there? Man, I'm not really proud of this one. Um, I mentioned conservation of momentum. Um, and I said, the uh, I meant to say the thrower experiences a force. I didn't say it was equal and opposite to the force exerted on the ball. That was my bad. And I've, I've mixed up, I've done everything I told you not to do and everything that my students have done wrong. I've mixed up forces and momentum. So I've, I've not done a very good job on that question. Um, please make sure when you, when you really royally mess up these questions like, like I've done here. And it's funny because I've done this question months ago. Um, 
really look at the constructive criticism of what they've said to do here, okay? So they've, they've gone and said, um, either talk about conservation of momentum or talk about Newton's third law. Don't do both, okay? Um, what does it say here? If no other mark awarded, allow because there's little or no friction. You get one mark for that if you really are desperate. But um, you can see here they've got four points. What's the similarities of them? Well, you can either talk about mentioned conservation of momentum or you can mention Newton's third law. Newton's third law uh, allows for the conservation of momentum. Okay, so you could e mention either one, that's fine. And then you're going to say, hey, the momentum of the snowball and skater or the forces on the snowball and skater, one mark, are equal and opposite. In either case, equal and opposite, whether you say it's the momentum of the snowball and skater or the forces acting on them. They are equal and opposite, that's two marks. And you could be done right there. You don't have to understand much more than that. That's fine. This is something you can, uh, you know, I, I don't encourage memorizing, but it's something that you could go, oh, I've seen this, I know this. And if you wanted to get a little more technical, the, the, the momentum initially is zero, or you could say that the, the rate of change of momentum is the same for both forces, okay? So uh, that's a much better answer um, than what we've what we've said here, okay? I think I was kind of explaining what's going on, but we you know we, there's a fine line between what's going on with the physics and what the examiners are going to look for. Let's look at part C here. I think we've probably done this one a bit better, okay? If we take a look at part C, again, th oh my goodness, three different ways to explain this one, okay? Do it in terms of momentum or acceleration or pressure. I think we did it in, in terms of momentum. We said if we uh, increase the impact time, the contact time, for the same change in momentum, we said, that means that it will be a reduced uh forces rate of change of momentum. Uh, we, we didn't say forces rate of change of momentum, but we said it reduces the force on the knee, didn't we? We had said that, okay? We said uh, when the change in momentum is constant and we increase uh, this time, it will decrease and it will, it will, um, the, it'll decrease the force, it will hurt less. So we've, we've gotten there, that's fine. Where did that, e where did this come from? This came from the fact that force is the, if I move this, over here, we've said force is the rate of change of momentum. So we've done it that way. Let's to look at the other ways you could have said it. You could have said, hey, um, we're going to increase the the distance or the time to slow down. Okay, the, we're going to increase the distance to slow down because there's a knee pad in the way between that person's knee and the ice. Okay, uh, it will take longer or it will take long, large, longer time. Okay, now there's ways in which you can look at uh, initial and final velocity. You've got this one here, which is time. Oops, I've run out of room, but this is uh, plus 2as, and that's time independent. But if you've got uh, a bit less of a distance in here, you can see uh, it's the same change in velocity, but because it's a, a increased distance or uh, an increased time, you can see what's going to happen here, right? If I rearrange this one here, v squared is zero because we're coming to rest. We're going to have u minus u squared is equal to two uh, as. And if we have uh, if we have increased the distance, we are going to and we have the same change in velocity. We will reduce the acceleration. You can make the same argument for. Uh, v equals u um, plus at. Okay, we can bring negative u. Uh, I'll bring t over here. I'll say, hey, there's the acceleration. We've we've increased the contact time. We're going to decrease the acceleration. If we decrease the acceleration, you know, force is mass times acceleration. So we've lowered the acceleration. We lower the force. Okay. I don't know. I feel the momentum one is the is the simplest one. And then of course you've got the pressure as well. Uh, what do we got for pressure here? Uh, increased surface area. Yeah, okay, I like this. You know that pressure is force divided by area. And if we're going to increase that surface area, because instead of you landing on your tiny little knee bone, you've got a big, huge knee pad. You've increased that surface area, which means um, because... Uh, what is this now? We've the idea of increased area, reduced force, pressure equals force divided by area, reduces the pressure on the knee. This is starting to get a little convoluted here. 
uh, reduced force. If we've increased this, well, we've got this formula here. It reduces pressure on the knee. I'm not sure what's what they're talking about with reduced force here. Although you only need to say three of these. If you wanted to do it this way, I'd say, hey, look, I've got a I've got a larger knee pad here rather than my small little bony kneecap hitting the, the, the ice. And so if I've increased the area, I'm going to decrease the pressure exerted on the knee is the way I would look at it. I've got it from that formula. I suppose you might say that the pressure exerted uh, or the force, see what happens here is the force exerted by the pad on the knee is equal and opposite to the force of the knee on the pad. But because this is larger, you could have these forces. Well, what you end up having, if these forces are equal, you end up having P1A1 equals P2A2. And if, 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 if the area of your knee pad is larger than your little kneecap area, and if these are constant, it's a reduced pressure exerted by the knee pad on your knee, I suppose. This makes it seem a bit confusing. I feel the momentum is the way to go. Let's move on. This is June 2018, again IGCSC, and uh, a, a test car runs into a wall, it, it stops in 0.4, uh, 0 0.14 seconds, um, calculate the average force. Well, the net force is the rate of change of momentum so we're just gonna we're just gonna divide these 22,500 divided by uh, oops 22,500 divided by 0.14 uh, I get wow I get I get uh, that's what I get from my um, force there that that is quite a large number of forces I'm not sure how they're gonna round that Next part, use the ideas about momentum. They're telling you what to talk about here to explain how seatbelts can produce injuries. I think it's the same old thing as before. F net times delta T is your impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And I think I think it's going to be the same argument as before. Uh, when we got a constant change in momentum, it means that if we can uh, increase the amount of time it needs for that body to slow down it will be less force experienced I know you see pictures of people getting um, you know bruises and whatnot from there being a seat belt but uh, that's probably uh, with a reduced force hitting them rather than the force with which they would hit the windshield or the steering wheel or that sort of thing the seat belts aren't going to prevent injuries but they will reduce injuries because they're going to reduce they're going to lower the force being felt um, Let's just take a look at the mark scheme on that one real quick. 160,000 newtons is what we had said. I think I'd written down the the, the, the actual seven yeah 714. Good full marks for a bald answer. It's a pretty straightforward calculation, but you you really don't do yourselves any favor if you write down the wrong digit and get it all wrong. What if you accidentally had your zero look like an eight? Then it's then it's all for naught. I would show your working so that if you've made a, a boo boo, you can at least still get some of the marks. Okay, the second bit, it's what we've said before. Longer time of impact for the same moment of change means we have a reduce in force and uh, passenger stays on the seat, not thrown from the vehicle. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, feel, I feel we've reduced the force and so they're not hurt themselves as much. Um, this whole passenger stays on the seat, not thrown from the vehicle, that has nothing to do with uh, the momentum they've asked us to talk about. Although I suppose... If you wanted just one mark, you could say, hey, the seatbelt prevents you from being thrown from the car because you would have momentum propelling you forward through the window, through an open window or through the windscreen. But uh, I don't know if that really goes with uh, talking about momentum. I think the first three points go together quite nicely. Okay, this last one is, is not as much. I mean, you can any combination of these three will do so. Uh, do do what you can, but I think if you get an answer correct, like let's say you got this answer, and let's say you had said point one, two, and four, were, were, was your was your logic there? Um, that to me, 
yes, you've got three out of three, but it illustrates a, an incomplete understanding. And I think you should always be looking to improve your answers, uh, no matter what you're getting on these tests, because uh, maybe next time it's not going to be good enough. Okay, so I really feel um, one to three kind of work together in the best synergy. Always be looking to improve your written answers. Uh, I think that's the way you need to do these things. Okay, let's uh, go on and take a look at this question here. This is from 2014, and I believe this is uh, a paper two. Right, uh, yeah, it's, it's back. I mean, not all these momentum questions are going to be the same, but uh, this is just a simple... Uh, four mark question. Talk about momentum to explain how this airbag can reduce injuries to the pedestrians. Uh, do you know what? I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I, I feel that this is the exact same question we've seen here. Shall we look at the mark scheme real quick? Any four of... Um, oh, there's, there's, it's, there's a lot more to draw from in this uh, here. Momentum is reduced. You will have a change in momentum. Yeah, okay by the same amount so I it's what we've said before constant uh, not I should be careful when I say it's not constant momentum it's a constant change in momentum which means this momentum is reduced by the same amount they are taking the one mark that you got from previous answers and they split it into two marks which is very lucky but you'll only get it if you get the correct wording okay you're gonna do it over a longer time which is what we had said and so the force is reduced and boom that's that's what we got that was three marks before that was a three mark question but look at this folks this is a four mark question so you can kind of see this is going to be needing a little more detail okay now if you did the same thing we had said before you've already got the four marks don't we we're going to have the momentum reduced you're going to have a positive momentum changing into a momentum of zero. So it is a reduction of momentum. The, the change in momentum is negative. So yes, momentum is reduced, but at a, uh, at the, uh, by the same amount. It's the same lowering of momentum. Again, this is the formula. Okay. Constant change in momentum, meaning compared to if these other things different times different forces okay over a longer time reduced force and what's this use of force equals rate of change of momentum yeah so if you said this if you said force is equal to the rate of change of momentum and you or you could just say hey uh, the force is reduced so there's less injuries less damage yeah I you know again th those th th this this type of question if you practice this enough that can be an easy three to five marks guaranteed so keep practicing on that one All right let's uh, take a look at a few other Newton's laws types of questions now this this is a written one I'm not going to spend the time uh, writing it all out but uh, explain how Newton's laws apply to a rocket as it lifts off from the ground it's six marks this is a WJC question this is from uh, June 2017 paper two what I would suggest is you break it down to Newton's first law Newton's second law and Newton's third law and you come up with two comments for each okay I'd say something along the lines of well when it lifts off there's an external unbalanced force which causes it to accelerate the acceleration is non-zero you could say for Newton's second law that the uh, the rate of ex or the, the acceleration of course you know is inversely proportional to the mass so you know that as the mass reduces when the fuel is expended uh, you should get uh, a larger and larger acceleration, so the acceleration will not be constant. Something along these lines, maybe a little more detail. And then the third law, you could say that the uh, the force of the um, exhaust on the air is equal and opposite to the force of the air on the exhaust. This is what actually pushes the rocket upwards. That sort of thing. Let's uh, let's just take a look at what the indicative content would be according to the first law. Um, change in motion must be acted upon by by a resultant force or, or an external unbalanced force so we've said that I do a little more detail but you've got that the third law the gases that are pushed out creates an equal and opposite force on the rocket so you could say um, right the rockets pushing out the, the the exhaust is pushing the gases out 
and the gases are pushing on the air. The air is pushing back on the gases. The air is it's going to end up pushing the rocket. It's a bit tricky that that one there, but I think just something along these lines. Air is pushed out equal, just equal and opposite force, and that's what pushes the rocket force. That is the thrust force. That's what all you really need to say. Okay. And you can talk about, uh, you know, F equals MA, and you could talk about, oh, yeah, the uh, rate of change of momentum. The net force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Now, I was talking about the mass decreasing and therefore the acceleration going up, but they're not that advanced if they just want to talk about uh, this is a better definition for Newton's second law than uh, as, a pair, uh, as opposed to F equals MA. And so you could say, hey, uh, this net force is good to cause a rate of change of momentum. Okay, and yeah, that's that. Uh, something along those lines, uh, but maybe in a bit more detail. Sorry to rush through, but uh, I do want to make sure we can we can fit everything in here. Okay, uh, let's move on. Let's take a look at here. This is a good question. Uh, just real quick, uh, the, do these ones a skydiver? And so, what do they got here? They've got 800 newtons going down which means uh, 200 going up. So, th so the net force, the resultant force, they've given you the formula there, is 600. And the mass of this person is 80. So 60 divided by 8. Acceleration is 7.5. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we've, we've done this calculation here. They want the resultant force. You probably get a mark for 800 minus 200 over, and then the 80. Uh, I've just written it as 600. That's fine. And there you go. Uh, right. So this question here, it's another one of these uh, six markers on the WJC. Uh, these are very common. You really want to practice these best you can. Um, I, again, I would suggest if you could break things up into three sections or maybe two sections. So they've said here in terms of forces, explain what's happening with the forces and then how terminal uh, speed is achieved. So let's, let's, let's say part three for the terminal speed, terminal for the landing. Let's save uh, part three for terminal speed and the landing. Let's talk about what happens in the beginning and then what's going on. Okay, so why a pair a skydiver decelerates when the parachute's opened? Okay, so you can say initially. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening um, initially. And then when you open the chute. So initially, you will have a weight which is greater than the drag. And so you will be accelerating downwards. You will be getting faster and faster and faster. Okay. Um, now, it, even if you don't open the chute, you will get a terminal velocity when these forces uh, uh, match up. But and, and, and they even out. And when you go faster, then you, you have more of a drag. But that's not what's happened yet. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. We can just say person jumps out. They will accelerate. They will be going faster than the drag force. The drag force will increase, but it won't be enough. When you open the chute, all of a sudden, you've got a huge drag force, and that will be larger than the weight, okay? And so you will have a net force which is directed upwards. The net force means you will be, um, it, you'll be experiencing an acceleration upwards, but since you are traveling downwards, this is a, uh, a slowing down. It's a deceleration, and so this, this skydiver will slow down. Now, they will continue to slow down. But of course, as they slow, uh, the the other part which is in here, as they slow down, that drag will be reduced. As the drag is reduced, the overall uh, arrow of what's going upwards, you know, you, you, that drag will reduce. The not the drag from the parachute, but just uh, the air resistance on the person and 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 yeah, the chute a little bit, I suppose. And then once once those forces equalize, now your net force is zero. And when your net force is zero, you don't have any acceleration. So what we would do probably is we would design this parachute to be uh, large enough. This goes into the next question. We would we would design the parachute to be large enough so that we 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 know what the terminal speed will be, and it will be something which is manageable for the person when they land. Okay, so something along those lines, I would say for those three. Now we take a look at the indicative comment, and so when the chute is opened, the, the okay. So we didn't we we uh, we started off with an initial, didn't we? We started off with what happens at first, and maybe that's not the best way to go. Uh, maybe we break this off as uh, you know. I would talk four marks worth of this stuff and two. Maybe you do it as a three-three split. Let's uh, let's see what they've said here. Okay, so. Uh, when the chute's open, there's a big air resistance uh, that, that goes upwards. The bigger 
this is bigger than the person's weight. Yeah, hopefully we want a resultant force to be upwards, and this is a net force upwards, which is causing a deceleration. So I think we've got about three marks there. As the speed decreases, maybe, maybe only two, I don't know. As the speed decreases, the air resistance decreases, yes, and the deceleration will decrease. Okay, good. That's good. Maybe you do split it up into uh, groups of three. Maybe this is the middle bit. Okay, as we have been slowing people down, the drag's going to decrease and the deceleration will decrease. It will de it will the speed will be decreasing at a decreasing rate. It will level off on a graph. Eventually, the speed uh, is so low, the air resistance and weight are equal. That's the ultimate point. And that, at that point, we're not going faster. We're not going slower. That's leveled off, but we're not going to increase the speed. And so that's the terminal velocity. You can talk about when the, when the two forces are bounced, we get the terminal velocity. Okay. Um, I hate to kind of rush through these types, but um, it's time consuming to do all the writing. Take a look at how you break up these questions into the, the three parts and that sort of thing. Right. Let's take a look at what the answer was for the um, for the the part C here okay uh, what did we say here we had said um, we want a bigger parachute uh, if someone has a larger mass then they, we need them to have a larger drag because it needs to bounce the larger weight in order to have a larger drag you need a larger area what have they said here uh, bigger surface parachute means a bigger surface area yes uh, that's what we said we get a mark to give a bigger air resistance for the upward force. That's the reason why, because we want it to counteract the bigger weight. That's kind of what we had said. And this is very typical of WJEC and even EDUCAS. Um, either the second mark must be linked to the first or the third mark must be linked to the second. Okay, so you can't just say these three points. You have to have some sort of sentence and say, yeah, well, we want this because we need this. And that's kind of what we had said. We'd said, hey, uh, Larger mass means a larger weight, therefore we're going to need a larger drag in order to bounce off that larger weight eventually, and in order to get that larger drag we need a larger area. That's what we had said, so you, we've, we've kind of linked them there, okay? And maybe we just say, well, why do we need a bigger area? Uh, because it'll be a bigger air resistance, and you know, we said they need them to balance. We said um, bigger... I guess we had said bigger shoot means bigger area, big, bigger air resistance. It's hard to say because I didn't write it down, but you guys know what I'm saying. It's more about just how we, we would, um, you know, get the three marks worth. You need three separate points worth of things. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's move on. Right, let's get into some moments questions, okay? Uh, just for a moment to end off the video, haha. <laughs> uh, right, uh, state the principle of moments. This is something you need to know. It's a two minute def. Uh, <laughs> this is something you need to know. It's a two mark definition. Definitely make sure you know this. Uh, this is a rotational uh, aspect of, of what we've got with equilibrium. It's in a way, it's a rotational uh, a, a version of uh, the net forces. If you've got forces which are balanced, there is no acceleration. If you've got moments which are balanced, there is no rotational effect. And basically, uh, I would write it mathematically as the sum of all the moments. Now, I'm going to use T for torque. Maybe you use M for moments. But basically, the sum of all the moments in the clockwise direction equals the sum of all the moments in the anti-clockwise direction. It'll be something along those lines. Sum of clockwise moments equals sum of anti-clockwise moments. One mark in order to be balanced or in equilibrium. Okay, that's the second mark. Okay. That's what you need to say. S similarly here, you know, if the forces, uh, if F1 is equal to F2, if the forces are bounced here, there is no net external force and there is no uh, acceleration. So that's what we need to be in equilibrium or, you know, not moving, not accelerating, not, not a rotational acceleration. Very, very closely related to Newton's law there. Okay, uh, what do we got here? We got a question uh, with a pivot. We've got, let's see, we got 40 centimeters distance here. This pivot is 50, okay, so this is 10 centimeters between here and the pivot. Uh, over here, this is this is uh, this is at 80 centimeters. So from 50 to 80, that's 30. So don't just start uh, using these numbers here. That's a common mistake. Look at what your different your distances are there. Now that's 0.2 newtons. Describe how the student could use an electronic balance to check the plastic strip weighs two newtons. An electronic balance. Just put it on the balance, hit tear, and get the measurement. I don't quite understand. 
that, I think we, I want to move on to, so just how the student could improve the precision of one of his measurements. Um, well, I would suggest we, uh, how many marks is this? I would suggest we um, take several trials and do an average. State the linking equation uh, for, for moment force and perpendicular distance. Yeah, well, uh, the, the moment, okay, whether you use M or torque, is equal to the force, which is perpendicular to the distance. I'm not sure what you've been taught about how to denote that, but that's a nice way of saying that the perpendicular distance, okay? The principal, use the principal moments to calculate the force, act, okay, at the, at the 40 centimeter mark. Uh, acting on the meter rule at the 40 centimeter mark. Well, I mean, if we, if we multiply this, 2 newtons times uh, 30, I think that's going to give us uh, 6. So th if these are to be balanced, then, then this would need to be 6 newtons there is going to be... Uh, is going to be my guess. We we had used that formula, and it was it was um, thirty times 0.2. So I'm going to say say six newtons. It's just a reason why the weight of the rock will be different from your calculated force. Um, well, I would know. Are we taking into account the weight of this little clip? We take into account the weight of the cup. Are we going to be off by uh, you know the odd millimeter here or there? Um, th that might uh, take that all into account. So it's just one marker. Let's let's have a look at what they're saying here. So I'll, we'll we'll go backwards. Um, calculated force includes the weight of the beak. Yeah. So as we said, weight of the beaker. Uh, weight of the beaker should be subtracted. Maybe then. Oh, there we go. Mass of the paper clip or the string. Usually the questions will word it as a massless string, that sort of stuff. Center of mass of ruler may not be exactly at 50 centimeters. Yeah. That's always a tricky one to measure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what's going on here? Whoa, wasn't six, wasn't six. Uh, I was rushing through it. I was rushing through it. Uh, it's the 30 centimeter mark, but that means uh, the 30 centimeter mark means 0.3 meters. And if we've got 0.3 times 0.2, we actually have 0 0.06 newtons. So that's what, oh, what's going on here? Ah, okay, they wanted the force. I, I kind of rushed that, didn't I? Uh, calculate the force acting on the meter rule. They wanted the force at that point. At the, So they basically were saying, what's this force here? Okay, so if you've done this equation, it's kind of like saying, hey, I want to do R1, F1 equals R2, F2. And I hadn't done that. Okay, so this is 0 0.06. This R was a 0.1 because it was 10 centimeters. Therefore, what is F1? F1 is going to be 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.1, which is going to make it 10 times larger. So it's going to be 0 0.6 newtons. Okay, I rushed through that. you got to be um, careful. Okay, and then up to here, how could we improve the precision of the measurements? Uh, yeah, smaller division. Ugh. Okay. Use a millimeter ruler. Use a bounce that measures more decimal places. Huh. Okay, so how can we improve the precision? I think I read that as accurate, accuracy. I'm getting to the end of the video, and I'm I'm rushing. And this these are the mistakes you make when you are at the near at the um, end of a test as well. So it's the precision. So yeah, we want smaller divisions on our rulers. We want a bounce that measures smaller divisions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, how could you how could you check that this plastic strip weighs uh, 0.2 newtons. Yeah, so what did they say? Measure the mass of it in kilograms, multiply mass by G. Oh, I mean, that's... Uh, it, it seems it seems so obvious that it, it, it actually is a difficult question. So, take the mass in kilograms and then multiply by G. Yeah. One mark for measuring it in kilograms, one mark for multiplying by G. Okay, a uh, bit of a, yeah, you really got to be in the right mental state when you look at some of these questions or you will trip yourself up. But let's take a little more care on this one. Uh, right, here's the equation. Work is uh, force times distance. Ah, oh, on these AQA ones, I cannot draw with my pen, which is a bit annoying. Um, use the equation. Yeah, okay, well, we're going to just basically do the, the, the 11,500 uh, times the... Uh, the, the 6.2 uh, meters, isn't it, right? That What's the work that's been done? I get uh, 29,900 
joules. Let's just check that as we go. Yeah, 29,900, that's fine. Moving on here, uh, the weight of the crate causes about 13,800 newton meter torque, uh, you know, a, a moment about the center of the truck. What is the uh, minimum size of the anti-clockwise moment needed so the forklift does not topple over? Well, it needs to be the same because we just saw that in the principle of moments from the other question. It needs to be the same value. It needs to be 13,800. Yeah, okay. So boom, principle of moments question right there. That's an application of the basic knowledge, okay? Write down the equation which links force, distance, and a moment of force. It's actually really not that much different than this except you might put your little uh, upside down T as your perpendicular sign there just so you've got that distance. What do they say? Moment is force times distance. Yeah, the M, M is equal to F times D. Uh, you might do R times F uh, depending on, on your teacher, what you've learned, but that's, that's the equation you use there. And then calculate what the distance D would be. So they told you about this 13,800, okay? Um, and we, we, we've got that mass going down, and then there's the D. So I'm guessing it's 13,800 divided by 15,000, yeah, 11, sorry, not 15,000, uh, divided by 11,500. And yeah, there's your answers, 1.2. A fairly straightforward moments question, I would say, here from AQA. Right. Um, sorry to kind of rush through, but uh, wanted to, to get this all in within the time. I, I hope we've covered moments and levers adequately enough for you. I, I think if you practice a couple of questions, you start to know it's the same thing with the momentum. It's the same thing with these WJC type uh, um, you know, written questions. Uh, I think with a little bit of practice, you know how to break things down and find the answers. Okay. Thanks for watching this episode of iRevise, and we'll see you next time.